The reason why you can't stop overeating is not that something's wrong with you or you're not trying hard enough. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. See, my co-coach Lucy struggled with overeating for half her life, constantly falling off the wagon, stuck in an unhealthy binge cut binge cycle. And just saying stop overeating or trying harder didn't help. In fact, it made it worse. But once she understood how to work with her overeating patterns by doing these five things rather than trying to beat them into submission, she started developing a better relationship with food, which led her to finally lose weight in a healthy way. And we have tested this on hundreds of our Badass Body Boss students who experienced the same transformation. But to get how this works, you must first understand where this overeating pattern comes from. For Lucy, she grew up as a stereotypical good student who made straight A's. And while this perfectionist tendency served her well when it came to schoolwork, one area wasn't going so well. I wasn't happy with my size and I didn't like how overeating made me feel. I just wanted to feel more in control of my body and my food decisions. And I thought losing weight should be easy, right? You just eat less. So she tried to eat less, and while the pounds did drop at first, she'd eventually overindulge on a family night out, all the time thinking, I shouldn't be doing this, but unable to stop. And then the dessert would arrive, and I thought, well, I already screwed it up anyway, so what the heck? The next day when she saw her weight shoot up, she'd be furious with herself. You're not trying hard enough, I'd scold myself. So next, she counted calories to force herself to stay on track. For more motivation, she also started following Fitspo influencers on social media. I'd look at all these people losing weight quickly, never messing up, the straight A students of weight loss. And I was like, this is who I need to be. It's either this or I'm a failure. And at the time, I thought that's what motivation was. But soon, someone would have a birthday party and Lucy would overindulge on cake, overshooting her calorie target. This time, she felt not only horrified, but also ashamed of herself. I'd think, how could I let this happen again? I know better than this. What is wrong with me? And then I'd go to the fridge and eat all the leftover cake because I was in such a state of self-defeat and thinking, why bother? After a few days of this, she regained even more weight than before. Finally, she decided to eliminate entire food groups from her diet completely. And well, you can probably guess how that turned out. In the area of weight loss, she felt like an F student. By the time she was in college studying psychology, she learned that beating yourself up when you do something wrong only causes you to do that thing more. No matter what she tried, she would always slip up. And each time that happened, she felt more self-defeated than the previous time, which drove her to give up and binge more. So she resolved to stop beating herself up, but that only made things worse. I'd overeat and find myself getting upset. And then I say to myself, don't be upset. But trying to make the feeling go away just made it stronger. I ended up beating myself up for overeating anyway. Plus, on top of that, I was now beating myself up for beating myself up. It was like trying to put a band-aid on cancer. During this time, she received an assignment from class to freeform journal for a month and review what comes up. At the end of that month, she read through her journal entries and was floored by the harsh words that showed up. Things like, I suck, I'm bad, I failed, I ruined my diet again. And ah, uh, you get the gist. It was a wake up call to see how cruel I was being towards myself and saying things about me I would never say to another human being. And I saw that whenever I said those things to myself, I'd always give up on myself and just binge more. She saw how urgent it was for her to handle her letdowns in a healthier way. So she'd stop spiraling out of control after a slip up. She had to put the brakes on this now or else she'll never stop the cycle no matter what new diet she tried next. So I sat down and asked myself, if I would never say these cruel things to someone else, what would I say? She highlighted every abusive sentence in her journal and asked, how would I say this to someone I cared about? Instead of, I'm bad, she would say, you feel bad. Instead of, I failed, she'd say, this didn't work out. Instead of, I suck, she'd say, this sucks. I'm still admitting that things may suck, so I'm not lying to myself. But by speaking this way, I'm also not attaching anything to my self-worth. This made her stop feeling so panicked and hopeless in the moment, which gave her breathing room to zoom out and brainstorm more productive ways to cope next time. For instance, she noticed her negative self-talk occurred most frequently when she was already overeating. So she rewrote the narrative by folding a paper in half. On the left side, she'd write down what she usually says to herself. On the right side, she'd write down what she'd say to someone else. Instead of, I am bad for eating so much and will be fat forever, she'd say, you feel bad right now. When you feel better, let's come up with coping strategies to try next time. 
It may take trial and error, but at least you're not giving up. Then the next time this happened, she'd read this out loud to herself. Then later, she'd sit down to brainstorm all the coping strategies to try next time like this. And if she already beat herself up after overeating, instead of, I am a failure, she'd say, you're sorry you made yourself feel bad, but that doesn't make you a bad person. She repeated all these until they became ingrained. And over time, instead of spiraling out of control whenever she overate, she used them as learning opportunities. Now, while this helped her get back on the wagon faster after a binge, she still couldn't prevent them from starting in the first place. This was because she took care of only the internal side of things, but didn't do anything about the external triggers, a lesson she'd learn only after college. My boyfriend at the time was one of those people who was always skinny despite eating so much junk. And I would secretly envy him and chalk it up to, oh, he's just lucky he has high metabolism. But when they started living together, she saw a completely different picture. When we were out with friends, he'd eat all this burgers and fries and beer. But at home, when it was just the two of us, he actually ate like a monk. He naturally ate very little food, like 90% of the time. It was only when we were eating socially that he was eating so much food, which is only like 10% of the time. That's when it occurred to her that when she followed people on social media, she probably only saw just 10% of what they did and had no idea what else was going on beneath the surface for the rest of the 90%. Instead of fawning over social media, she started looking for examples of people who lost weight and kept it off in real life. And what she discovered surprised her. First, the most successful people didn't keep addictive foods like chips and desserts readily available at home, but they did still treat themselves occasionally when going out for a special occasion. I had thought I needed to work harder than most people in order to resist cravings. But the most successful people don't have more willpower. They just keep fewer temptations around. If they don't keep addictive foods at home, then of course they were less likely to crave them. So why work harder to resist cravings when I can make things easier for myself by changing my environment? So Lucy either cleared out all the addictive foods from her home or hid them somewhere not easily accessible. She would still allow herself to indulge sometimes, but save those moments for truly special occasions, usually when others are around to share the food with. If she knew she had a night out with friends coming up, she could also plan ahead to eat lighter earlier in the day so she had room later at night. And if she had any leftovers she didn't want anymore, she'd share them with the next day with her neighbors and coworkers. By still allowing herself to indulge sometimes, rather than trying to restrict herself completely, she she wouldn't feel the urge to overeat as much when the time came or beat herself up if she did since it was a planned indulgence anyway. However, while this helped dramatically reduce the number of overeating episodes, there were still times when she succumbed to unplanned overeating. For instance, work stress and surprise team lunches. When she complained about this to her real life weight loss friends, they all said the same thing. I do that too. She discovered that everyone who had successfully lost weight slipped up regularly, whether that was due to unplanned social events, stress eating, or something else. It was impossible for anyone to stay on track 100% of the time. She thought weight loss charts looked like this, but in reality, they looked more like this. There were no straight A's in weight loss. Some slipped once or twice, a month, others a few times a week. Turns out the number of slip ups didn't really matter too much. Instead, the biggest predictor of weight loss success was the rate at which people got back on the wagon after the slip up. This makes sense because one day of overeating on a night out won't make a dent in your weekly average if you stay consistent the rest of the time. But if you beat yourself up and stay off the wagon, only then do these calories start adding up. So instead of making sure to meet her calories every day, Lucy focused on keeping her weekly average close enough to her target even if she went over here and there. Finally, after all this and seeing what was truly normal, Lucy found that the same Fitzbo influencers who used to motivate her in the past were now demotivating her as they triggered her to compare herself to unrealistic perfectionism. So she unfollowed them and reclaimed her sanity. Once she did all five of those things, she finally got her eating under control and lost weight. I had thought that in order to succeed at weight loss, I need to push myself and work harder at it. All perfectionist tendencies. But what I really needed was the exact opposite, to go easy on myself and make things easier for me, being an imperfectionist. As she continued to embrace her newfound imperfectionism, even after losing the weight, something unexpected happened. She started having it easier in other areas of life too. Because she no longer felt the need to be perfect, she was able to enjoy just doing her best under realistic expectations in all areas of life. And her health, work, relationships all flourished as a result. Now you know how to work with your overeating patterns, but even if you're doing everything right, you may still be doing the right things at the wrong time for fat loss. This is the 
number one tactical mistake I see all the time and can drastically slow down the rate of progress you could be making. So two things. First, if you want my help shortcutting through all of the trial and error to figure out how to level up your journey, then check out the free sneak peek into my Badass Body Boss program in the description and comments below. Or if you want to DIY it, then you don't want to ignore this video where I reveal the reason why you're not losing fat easily despite doing all the right things and what to do instead, regardless of what stage in the journey you're at. So you don't want to miss this. And always remember, you can do it.